If you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 3. As you're turning there, thank you, Dakota, and our worship team for leading us in a time of beautiful worship this morning. Acts chapter 3, happy Father's Day to all of you that are dads, and uh, glad that we can be here together this morning to worship the Lord, our Heavenly Father. So here in Acts chapter 3, as you'll remember, uh, Jesus has already come to earth, lived out the law of God's word perfectly, died on the cross as our righteous substitute, has now risen back to life and rules now over all mankind and over all nations from heaven. The Holy Spirit has also now come and uh, dwells in the followers of Jesus. We've seen that the church has been born. Because of Jesus, we now have access uh, to him whenever and wherever. Also, the church has been established by Jesus himself, meaning that together, followers of Jesus are, we are now a family. And this family, we don't just come to a building each week simply to receive religious services, but now as a family called the church, we gather together to give and produce good works of love from our hearts for the glory of God and the, and the good of others. We've seen that the church at its very inception was a movement. And a movement moves. And we've seen uh, the conviction that molded this movement. What got that early church so pumped up and, and fired up was this conviction that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed the Son of God, sent by God, to explain God, and then to reconcile the world to God. That truth is, is what fueled the, the heart flame of this first century church. They are passionate. They're passionate. Their passion is genuine. It's authentic. Because they have now found life in Jesus Christ. And as I studied this passage over this past week, I, I had to ask myself the question, am I also authentically passionate about Jesus and what he's done in my life? And are we as a church passionate because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. In other words, is our spiritual life ablaze? Is it in a transformed state because of what Jesus has done initially in us and continues to do in us? Here in chapter 3, three we have this miracle that takes place and as we work through this miracle, we want to ask ourselves just a handful of questions. But before we do that, I want us to understand that what these men and, and what these women had, the, the zeal that they possessed was because of the very life and presence of Jesus now represented by his spirit. They had a personal moment 
by moment, real relationship with the risen Savior. And that risen Savior, though not in their presence any longer, now dwelt in their hearts. And the question is, is that where we find ourselves today? Is Jesus really the treasure of our life? Is his word just words that are, that are written on our page? Or is the presence of Jesus really alive and well in our hearts? Have we been transformed? Are we in the process of being transformed? Well, the first thing that happens here in chapter 3 is that a crippled man gets physically healed. And the first question that we can ask ourselves as we kind of enter into this chapter is this. Do I have faith in my own life to be healed at my point of greatest need? Do I have faith in my life to be healed at my point of greatest need? It says here in verse 1 of chapter 3, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. So it's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and Peter and John, we know from previous scriptures, they're just kind of closely knit. They're good friends, and, and we find them here going to the temple to, to, to pray together and to pray with others. And you see, even though they no longer had to go to the temple to, to worship, they still did so. And, and there was nothing wrong with that. They, they simply were seeking to, to pray with others. And it says in verse 2, And a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms or gifts of those entering the temple. And so here we have this man born a cripple, and every day in his life to this point, parents or friends or neighbors have carried him to this part of the temple, this gate that enters into the temple. And because of his birth defects, by way of the Jewish law, he was not allowed to go into the temple and worship with the others. It's also known that in that day, crippled people were not taught a trade, but rather they were expected simply to become beggars. Now, this transport of bringing him to the temple stairway, this went on not just for days, not for weeks, not for months, but for years. And we know from our text also that this man is bankrupt, not just physically, but also financially. He's not in a good place. And it says in verse 3, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. Now, let's step back for a moment and think about this. When someone has a need and their eyes meet your eyes, what do we often do? You pull up to the light and there are people there that are going to hand you a flower if you give them money and they're looking straight at you. If you're like me, most often, you don't just gaze back at them, but you kind of look off. Right? Let's just be real with each other. But Peter, the scripture says, directed or set his gaze at him. What that means is that Peter gave this crippled man his attention. And that's important because I'm sure this crippled man who's laid there day after day after day, is full of shame and probably full of insecurity. And so there's no doubt that when he says to Peter and John, there's no doubt that when he asks for a gift from them, 
he's most likely looking down at the dirt. Because he's asking an embarrassing question. I'm just a beggar. I'm not like you. I can't go into the temple. And I'm sure this is what Peter says here to the crippled man when he says, look at us. It's almost as if these two disciples, now being filled with, with God's Spirit and living in this transformed state, are able to say, hey, it's all right to ask for help. It's okay to, to, to look at us. I love what it says in Psalm chapter 3, verse 3. It says this, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. And I honestly think that's what John and, and Peter are hoping that this man will now feel comfortable to do. And so this makes me stop and ask the question personally, is this the, the kind of kindness and compassion that I reflect off? Because the Spirit is living in me now. When someone of lesser fortune comes my way, is this the, the kind of heart attitude that I have? Notice what it says in verse 5, and, and he, that is the, the crippled man, fixed his attention on them expecting to receive something in return. But Peter said, I have no silver and I have no gold, but what I do have, I give to you. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Here we see that Peter is quick to, to point out that he also doesn't have a lot. He doesn't have things. He doesn't have money. But what he does now have, what he's rich with now, he is more than willing to give and to share with this man. You see, we have to remember that Peter and John, just a few years earlier, have literally given up have given up everything to follow Jesus. They've left their businesses together, their families, their home. And you know, we'd say in our day and age, as we look at that kind of situation, wow, they sacrificed an awful lot, didn't they? And they did. But notice that they didn't become poor in their hearts, but they actually became rich. In fact, they would have told us that what they had before meeting Jesus was nothing compared to what they had after. Notice also here this phrase, in the name of Jesus. That phrase is used some 35 times here in this letter and you and I know that there are lots of names given to Jesus in the Bible. In fact, there are over 200 names for Jesus in the Scriptures. But this one here is the top one. 800 times in the name of Jesus Christ is used. Back in Acts chapter 2, 38, it says that they were baptizing in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 3, 6, and 16, they were healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 8, 12, Philip was preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 15, 26, they suffered in the name of Jesus Christ. In fact, Acts 21, 13 says, Paul, it, Paul says that he was willing to die in the name of Jesus Christ. The word Jesus here means Savior. And what that means is that Jesus is central to the gospel message, the, the message of his word. 
He's the means by which heart change occurs in our lives. So they said to this man in verse 6, I I have no silver, I, I have no gold, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he, he stood and he began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Now, did Jesus just heal this man partially or halfway or Maybe just a little bit. No, it says that this man's feet and ankles were made strong. In fact, so strong that he leaped, which means that he sprung up, which means that he vaulted up, which means that he acted upon his faith. And he was able to do now, in the name of Jesus, what he could never do before. This man now was able to do what so many of us kind of just take for granted when we get up in the morning and put our feet on the floor. See, when God heals us, when God chooses to heal us, he heals us to the core in whatever area that might be in our lives. Not halfway, not partially, not just a little bit, When Jesus touches our lives, he heals all of us. Here's what I want us to see. Jesus met this man at the point of his greatest need. And so we just want to pause for a minute and answer this kind of question in our own heart and in our own mind. What what is your greatest point of need? What is your personal greatest point of need this morning? In other words, where is your heart most famished? You see, understand that God's not big into your want list but he is big into your need list. In fact, it says in Philippians chapter 4, God says that he will supply all of our needs according to the riches of his glory by his Son, Christ Jesus. This morning, what is it that, that you really need in your life? Do you choose to actually believe with confidence and trust that Jesus can do for you today what he did for this crippled man many, many years ago? Or is this just for you a story on a page in a big holy book? It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, Paul writes and he says, and, and, and God is able to bless you abundantly. Like to the core, all of you. So that in all things, at all times, now look at having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Do I have faith, do I have trust, do I have confidence to be healed at the point in my life where my greatest need exists? Here's a second question we should stop and ask ourselves often as we think through this text. Am I filled with awe and wonder at the work that God is doing around me? 
Look at verse 9. It says, you know, this incident, this miracle has happened. And it says in verse 9, And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple. That's pretty sad. They don't even know his name. But they recognize him as the one who's sitting there every day, day after day, asking for gifts or or asking for something that would help him. And it says in verse 10, they are filled with wonder and amazement at what has just happened to him. Now, that word wonder there is is a word that combines awe and fear. In other words, they were silenced in terror, but they were steered in amazement. As I thought about that, I I, I came to recognize, maybe in my own life, maybe just in the lives of those around me, but there really does seem to be in our world today little that astonishes us anymore or amazes us. Maybe you take a trip to the Grand Canyon Uh, Maybe you watch on TV the the devastating power of a tornado or a hurricane, and you sit back and you think, my goodness, that's amazing. I think we've lost this whole idea, this whole experience of sitting in the place of awe and, and, and wonder like of a sun that rises every morning, or lungs that that fill with air on every breath that we take. Or we look out the window and, and we see hundreds of shades of green. We go to the ocean and we see waves that most often will only go so far and never farther. All those things and many more aren't manufactured. They're not synthetic or contrived or they're not something that's been uh, put together on a computer in, in somebody's office. These are supernatural created things by our creator put in place to awe us, to to amaze us, to draw us to our maker. You see, that's essentially what God-ordained miracles do. They draw us to God. They're meant to draw us to Jesus. They're, They're meant for us to behold and to see the glory of our Creator. The creator of all things, as the scripture says. Well, it says in verse 11, while this man clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. You know, this is kind of funny if you step back and you think about it. These people at three in the afternoon have gathered together in the most holy place, the temple. And as you can imagine, the, 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 the environment, the atmosphere in that temple is most often, you know, very quiet. It's very holy. Things are to be very sacred and solemn. And it says here that all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to this man and the disciples. They do that because something supernatural has taken place. And it's so amazing that these people dropped the rules of routine for the awe of the supernatural. Who cares we're in the temple? Look what Jesus has done. He has, he has done what he said he could do. He's, he's healed a man. They're running around. 
And they're at awe, and they're at wonder, and they're taking this in. And they're celebrating the fact that there is something beyond human strength. And so, it begs the question, do we stop long enough to see and to experience ourselves the awe of God that's happening every day all around us? It says in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, all my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That's a good reminder for us today. Am I filled with awe at the work that that God is doing around me? Another question we should often ask ourselves is this. Am Am I a reflector of God's glory and greatness or just an absorber of it? Do I reflect all that God is in my life as his follower Or am I just an absorber? Do I just take it in? Am I just one big sponge? It says in verse 12, and when Peter saw it, he sees the amazement of the people, he begins to address them. So this is his second sermon. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and The God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses And by his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. The wonder of God is what, it's what we call God's glory. And it's God's glory that that radiates from God. It's his attributes that that are reflected out from him. We don't see God himself, but we we see his glory. We, We see his character. It says in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the the glory of God. And so when you see God working, that's his glory being. Presented. When you see God working through a person, that's God's glory being fleshed out. Now, when God is working through you, when God chooses to work through you in some instant, what do you do with that? What do you do with the, the, the words of kind encouragement? What do you do with those good emotions, those good feelings that are now going through you? You see, when God does something and he chooses you to be his instrument to deliver his glory, the way you know that it's God and not you is when you are so overwhelmed in that moment in your own spirit, you recognize just how unworthy you are to be used in this way. You don't get on the phone and call someone just to tell them what you just did and and how God chose you and how God chose to now work through you. Because when you do that, it's pride that begins to blossom in us. We have what's called this spiritual pride when we begin to think in our own minds and even communicate sometimes. You wouldn't believe what God did through me today. Peter says here to all these people who are just overwhelmed at this miracle, he says, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety 
we have made him to walk. See, it should really repulse us when we begin to take credit or become prideful for something that we've been a part of, that we know in our hearts only God could do. I'm to be a reflector of God's greatness, not an absorber of it. Well, the last question is, am I willing to turn from known sin and seek forgiveness whenever God reveals a a, a wrong in my life? Am I willing to repent, to to turn from known sin and seek forgiveness when God surfaces that in my life? Notice in verse 17 it says, Peter is now preaching and he says, And now, brothers, I know that, you know, when you are part of putting Jesus to death, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back. In other words, turn from your sin and turn to Jesus and find forgiveness that your sins may be blotted out and that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That's one of my favorite scriptures. Because here, what we're being told is that our creator, our creator loves us so much that even though our sin coincides with those that put Jesus on the cross, he still has grace for us. He still wants us to enjoy the times of refreshment that only he can bring. The spiritual heart longs for joy. It longs for peace. That's how we've been created. That's how our hearts have been formed. In fact, our hearts long for what only Jesus can give. And the scripture very clearly says to us here that when we live our lives in alignment with the will of God, we will live in that place of refreshment where God alone will satisfy our deepest needs. I hope that you'll allow these questions just to ruminate in your own mind. For you as dads, as you walk through today and being the leaders of your home, the called to be the spiritual leaders of your home, I I hope that, that you'll meditate on all that's laid out before us here in this short paragraph. Jesus is for us. And Jesus alone can heal us. And Jesus alone can awe us with what he does and can do in us. These are the things that bring us to that place of treasuring him above above all other things, above all others. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for the the sovereignty that you hold, the, the power over all of creation, even the power over our hard hearts. This morning, Lord, we'd ask that you would come and by your Holy Spirit, soften us that we might be attentive to your spirit working through your truth in our own hearts personally. Lord, where there is unbelief, I pray that you give us belief. 
Lord, where there's a lack of trust, I pray that you would give us trust. I pray, Lord, that you'd give us hearts of godly repentance, that we would want to turn from the sin in our life and turn to you, that there we might find abundant life and life eternal. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.